بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي رزقنا القرآن شفاء للنفوس وطمأنينة للقلوب يخفف الهم والحزن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين الذي بعث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين وصحبه المنتجبين اللهم صل على محمد Sisters and brothers, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, I can't believe it, to the 24th night of the program. Ramadan is practically for all intent and purposes over. The 29th, 24th uh, night of our program, Ramadan 2022. For those who celebrated Laylatul Qadr last night I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to f accept their prayers fasting, qiyam, siyam and everything else to grant them whatever they wished and inshallah resolutions made last night we will be able to practice and put them into practice it's one of the challenging things, and I believe the Jihad al-Akbar is to transition from those promises uh, that we make during the nights of power and resolutions to put them into practical uh, sense in our life after. يقول الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم إنا نحن نزلنا الذكر وإنا له لحافظون We have sent down the Quran and we are there to protect it The topic that I started last night technically I would have left it as purely academic issue that people that want to study uh, about the collection of the Holy Quran, they would uh, spend some time on it if it wasn't for the fact that this topic has become literally uh, something that the Shias are being hammered by because the position of the Shia in this regard misrepresented deliberately and no matter what we say still the, the whole thing again and again and again you can go on any website uh, and you see this this constant attack about uh, Shia not believing in the Quran or they are having a different Quran although as I said last night the theme or the topic is not new. It goes back to the, at least around the second, early century of Islam. Uh, but since the Wahhabi movement and this clear demarcation between what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, the Shias have been focused again and again. And I, th I think uh, it would be helpful for the brothers and sisters to spend some time reading about this uh, issue. There are plenty of books now available, articles online at islam.org and for purely English speakers, ta the translation of uh, Al-Bayan, Marhum Ayatollah Khoi, uh, it's extremely useful and uh, last night I pointed to the book and the usefulness of it. The gist of the question that frames the whole argument or the debate regarding the collection of the Holy Quran is as follows. It is known that the Quran was not revealed in one go. 
during Laylatul Qadr, one of the debates that we have or discussions that we have is that particularly for the Shia that claim that the beginning of the prophecy was around the end of Rajab and where Surah Al-Alaq uh, was revealed. At the same time, we have verses in the Holy Quran and passages that talk about revelation during the night of power. So how do we tally between the two? Uh, it, when we analyze and assess verses of the Holy Quran, we come across that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, send the Quran on two different levels. Number one, uh, that was sent to the heart of the Holy Prophet, that is night of the power. And then the gradual revelation over 23 years period, then uh, it's something that happened and we all accept. So the question is, it is known that the Quran was not revealed in one go. It was revealed over 23 years period and Laylatul Qadr. It is also known that it was not collected and arranged in chronological sequence. Because if we consider, and this is right across, both Shias and Sunnis accepted. Because if Surah Al-Alaq was supposed, was the number one verse, that the chapter that was revealed, it is looked at within the sequence, that current sequence that we have, uh, uh, it's not recited as number one verse or number one chapter in the Holy Quran. So the collection of the Quran, it's not sequential the way it was revealed. And it took place over 23 years. Then question, when was the text of the Quran correct, collected and give it, given its final shape, uh, who was responsible for the task and when? This, these are the three critical questions. And Shias and Sunnis, they differ in responding to these three questions. Or broadly speaking, even Shias fall within one category. There are three opinions. There are those who claim that everything was done during the life of the Holy Prophet. So not only the Holy Prophet was responsible for the revelation and command and the oral transmission to the uh, scribes that he collected to write down, he was also responsible to locate every verse and chapter and passage in the Holy Quran in the correct order. Because no debate about coherence of the Qur'an, nadm in the Holy Qur'an, will be able to proceed if we cannot link the current order that exists in the Holy Qur'an as a divine command. Something, not something that willy-nilly came to exist. So, the Holy Prophet, as the first person commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to interpret and command and transmit orally the Quran to those who wrote and as well as inform them where to position these verses and chapters must have looked at uh, the, the whole issue of collection in the light of the Holy Prophet knew not only from the verse knew what happened to the distortion that happened in the previous scripture, the earlier scriptures, that they were distorted and uh, at the end it was lost. That's number one. Number two, the debate between, well, they reject the fact that uh, the Holy Quran was collected, collected during Nadm and uh, the, the issue of collection uh, during the life of the Holy Prophet, both in terms of putting the verses together and collecting them in one volume. <clears throat> uh, this is, they say, no, there is not, uh, we don't need, it, it wasn't done during the life of the Holy Prophet, it was done after. 
Now, then comes the question, okay, who did it after? That's the challenging part. So, the verse here, uh, last night as I was discussing these uh, ahadith that we have that I'm going to briefly go over a few of them, Marhum uh, Ayatollah Khoi rahmatullah has in his book extensively has listed the number of ahadith that we have in books of Sahih, both Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim and others, one by one. Listed them, I think about 18, 19 of them. And uh, at the end, he, he just picked up the, ver the hadith and put it together and at the end has spent a huge amount of time in the assessment and analysis of these verses to see that there is some kind of inconsistencies when we add all these uh, had hadith together. Remember, if we were to go back of when, who, uh, when was the text of the Quran collected and into the final ship and who is responsible for it. So when it comes to understanding these two, there is huge degree of inconsistencies between, the chat, between these ahadith. I'm going to go to it in a in, in, uh, few, uh, few minutes. But let us, I wanted to uh, somehow touch upon few ahadith that we have in our books, including coffee, that unfortunately being misrepresented or misinterpreted by those who want to label Shia uh, that they have, they believe, in a different text. One of them is a hadith from uh, Kafi that says, I heard Abu Jafar, which is Imam Muhammad al-Waqir, saying no one among ordinary people claimed that he gathered the Quran completely as it was revealed, except, uh, uh, except Eliah since no one has gathered it and memorized it completely as revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, they try to interpret this, that this clearly states that Quran was, is not complete. Nobody has access to the, to the complete version of the Quran apart from Ali ibn Abi Talib. And then they move somehow segue into Mas'haf Ali, Mas'haf Fatima, and so on and so forth. If you look at this hadith, this hadith and this tradition and few other ones does not address the collection of the verse of the Holy Quran in the current form. What it says that the arrangement of the verses and chapters of the Holy Quran according to the revelation doesn't exist. And this is something that everyone agrees to. Because uh, again, as I said, we can go back to Surah Al-Alaq, at the moment, is considered to be the Surah chapter 96, uh, while it was the first chapter that it was revealed. So this notion is a fact that the arrangement of the Holy, Qur the, the Holy Quran was not done based on the chronological order as it was revealed. But they, they, they don't want to address the fact that uh, this is whether the Quran is complete or it is not complete. They, in the interest of time, I want to quickly wrap this up and inshallah from tomorrow night we will move into a couple of themes that we, I have not addressed in the past. There were at least one or two questions about them. In using the book thematic approach to Quran and uh, tafsir al mudui that we have in Arabic, both in Arabic and Farsi, uh, we can use it to uh, pick up a number of critical themes that are useful in our life. One is akhlaq, ethics and morality. If we were to present akhlaq to the Quran without even going to a hadith or anything else, what does Quran say about al-akhlaq al-islami, the moral and ethical Islamic value. Also, 
one of the other topics that uh, came in was the concept of family. We all, we all know that when Islam came, the dominant uh, frame of reference that in social structure that existed was tribal structure. Islam rejected the tribal structure in the favor of what we call the family structure. Why did this happen? And how Islam moved in to consolidate and underscore the, the, the importance of family. And naturally, what is the definition of family? What is the purpose of the family? And the, the responsibilities and the rights of every member within this unique social structure. And if it's necessary, then we can go back to the Holy Quran <clears throat> and talk about one of these uh, issues as well. Marhum Ayatollah Khoi starts in his book uh, by one of the hadith that we talked about it last night, that the gist of the hadith was during, because of the martyrdom or the loss, heavy loss of life during a couple of airy battles, uh, Abu Bakr calls for Omar and Zaid, that there is, we are confronting, uh, confronting, as we call it today, an existential problem. Most of these people that are being killed in these battles are Hufad al Quran, people who are, they have memorized the Quran, and if they disappear, we have, we have a fundamental challenge. Remember, the whole uh, verses, I mean the whole stories and ahadith that they have rests on the proposition that the Holy Prophet did not complete the Quran during his life in, in a single volume. Naturally, if he didn't, and you have all these people that uh, ultimately are the, uh, uh, they have memorized the Quran, memorizes of the Holy Quran, there is a possibility either that what they have in memory that has not been transmitted into papers uh, and solid form, or they may be in position of uh, some documents that ultimately destroyed. So Abu Bakr comes in, calls Omar and Zayd ibn Thabit, and they talk about it, that we, it's desperate, we really need to organize the collection of the Quran. You two are supposed to go to the, to the mosque and sit down and ask people as they come in if they have anything of the Quran in their position. Whether document or whether they have something in their, in their heart. They have memorized. And if they come in and they say that yes, we have whether the paperwork or whether uh, something in heart, ask for two witnesses. If there are two witnesses that supports this document, then you can include it. That was the first uh, hadith that we talked about. Now, the second one, number four on the list of uh, Marhum Ayatollah Khoi. Abu Bakr collected the Quran in sheets, Qaratis. He asked Zayd ibn Thabit to scrutinize them, but Zayd refused. Then Abu Bakr sought Omar's help in persuading him, and they both agreed. Uh, the book, the kitab, remained in Abu Bakr's keeping until he died. Thereafter, uh, they were kept in, with Hafsa, the wife of the Holy Prophet, Omar's daughter, until Uthman came to, uh, to power. Uthman asked Hafsa to give him a copy of the book that Abu Bakr uh, collected. She initially refused, and ultimately under oath that he's going to return the book to her, she gave it to him. Uh, the, he, he copied it and sent it around. Now, we immediately begin to see discrepancies. The first one, Abu Bakr is informed by the other two that, that we are uh, facing serious problem. The second one, Abu Bakr is the one who actually organizes uh, the collection of the Holy Quran. Another one, Omar decided, this is number eight on the list of hadith. Omar decided to collect the Quran. 
So he stood before the people in the mosque and said, whoever receives, received any part of the Quran directly from the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bring them to me. But with two witnesses. So now, even Zayd's uh, as an intermediary is bypassed. Now we have Omar directly trying to collect it. A tradition, another one, that says, no, uh, Zayd ibn Thabit met with Omar and they decided to, to organize the Quran and then presented to Abu Bakr. These are only few of the, the hadith that uh, the, uh, Marhum Ayatollah uh, Khoi has uh, collected in this book. Please read it. The reason why I'm saying, because you are going to face people, call it Wahhabi mindset or sectarian mindset, that constantly ask the same question again and again and again and accuse the Shia. Please have a background information about these ahadith. You, are, you need to reflect both on ahadith that exist in, the, in, in our books and learn the text to be able to inform uh, the, question, the person who asked the question that doesn't say the collection of, there is a dispute about the collection of the Quran. It says chronological order, and we, this is a fact that everybody accepts. And these ahadith are critical. Marhum Ayatollah Khoi, when he collects these ahadith, starts using his uh, expertise in Alm al Usul, Alm al Rijal and uh, what we call today critical analysis to go through one these ahadith out of the say 15 16 hadith one by one and say well the content here is is contradictory to another one to establish the inconsistency and then concludes so uh, number one when was the quran collected in a, sing a single codex the apparent sense of traditions too cited above suggests that the collection was undertaken during the time of Uthman. While a statement or tradition 1, 3, and 4, it indicates that it was during the time of Abu Bakr. We're beginning the first inconsistency. Who undertook the task of collection of the Holy Quran during the time, during the uh, during Abu Bakr's time, according to the tradition number 1 and 22, the person who undertook the task was, was Zayd ibn Thabit. While tradition number 4, it was Abu Bakr himself. Tradition number 8, it says Omar. So who was responsible? Uh, did any verse remain unrecorded? This is now critical. I was looking through uh, a few critical sites that accuse, now even Christians, they have uh, a number of sites. There's a site, how Abu Bakr, Omar, and Uthman changed the Quran. That's the title of the article. Strange enough, they have literally copied all the ahadith that Ayatollah Khoi has in Al-Bayan over there with the reference, the Arabic text and the English, with the reference, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Tarmadi, and everything else. And then their conclusion is, if the Muslims are critical about the concept of the New Testament and the validity of the New Testament, look at their book. This is their own references that questions the, the, the authenticity of the book. What guarantee do we have that during this transition from the early period until whether it's the third khalif, the second khalif, or the first khalif started seeing the existential threat, the critical threat, and then beginning to collect how much of the Quran has been missed? And then at the end, I mean, the, he goes in, did Uthman strike out anything else from the Quran? Because there is a hadith in the uh, hadith number 14 explicitly makes a reference that there were a number of 
parts of the Holy Quran that uh, Uthman st struck them off because there were no two uh, supporting witnesses for it. You can't see, I mean, uh, much more clearer statements that undermines the authenticity of Quran than this. Please read them. And then Mahum Ayatollah Khoi goes to the end and concludes. In summary, it has been adequately demonstrated that tradition about tahrif, corruption of the text in any form or shape, not only is contrary to the concept of ijma and consensus that exists in Muslims, uh, there was even uh, I, I, it, it was strange that I was re reading an, an article, a, a, a master's dissertation on the uh, correction of the, a collection of the Holy Quran, that there are a number of Sunni scholars recently, started from middle of last century, that they have become, they are using the critical analysis that, that the Christian and the Jews are using in assessing their own book in looking at these traditions and saying that according to this critical analysis, it really cannot make sense that uh, the Quran was not compiled or collected in a single volume during the life of the Holy Prophet. Uh, it has been adequately demonstrated that the tradition about tahrif, corruption of the text in any form, is nothing more than a delusion and an imagination maintained by those with weak reasoning because ahadith, unfortunately what has happened in elevate the khulafa up and bring them to the level of compilers and collectors of the holy quran and writes another privilege under the, their name the authenticity and the validity of the quran is undermined uh, or those who fail to take into consideration all the pertinent details needed to, uh, to drive a sound opinion, or those who are compelled to hold such opinion. Any rational person can detect the weakness of the argument of, the, of those uphold, upholding such a distorted view of uh, the state of affairs in the early history of Islam. Quran was collected during the life of the Holy Prophet and remains as such. It's a miracle that the verse that I recited earlier about the protection of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear. This is a message and I will protect it. So there is no alteration, no corruption, no addition, no subtraction. Yes, we can safely uh, state that the current arrangement of the Quran, starting from Surah Al-Fatiha, then going to Baqarah, and gradually moving until ending with Nas, does not fit what we call the chronological order of revelation. That's a fact. We can establish it without shadow of a doubt. Even one instance, Surah Al-Alaq, that big, uh, literally catapulted the whole uh, issue into public life, clearly states if it was number one verse revealed, we have it in the Holy Quran currently as 97. So that chronological order doesn't exist. But it doesn't mean if somebody denies that, that Quran that we have today, other, some, some things are missing within it, or there is an addition to it. It's not. This is the Quran that will remain as a living miracle until the end of time, inshallah. Uh, may Allah accept all of us uh, prayers during these coming uh, nights, whatever is left of uh, the, holy, the holy month of Ramadan. And uh, uh, please, those like myself and others that may not have had uh, the opportune moment during these nights to, do, to maximize our profit, there is our benefit from the month of fasting, there is still 
uh, five or six nights left. And as the verse in the Holy Quran said, we talked about it in the past, the issue of despondency from Allah's mercy is rejected by Quran. So we still have chance. We still can connect. Laylatul Qadr, as I explained a few nights ago, for the Imam might have passed, we still have an opportunity. If we can clarify our heart where it becomes the recipient of Allah's mercy, that is our Laylatul Qadr that transforms our life. May Allah protect us from all the shortcomings. Please keep everyone in your prayer. Thank you very much for being here and for listening. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.